started. Uh, I wanted to open up with a time of prayer before Brother Jason comes and teaches. We have several requests, so I want to ask you to stand with us. I don't know why I think you can pray sitting down, but uh, I'm afraid you're more apt to go to sleep sitting. So anyway, some of you, it's almost your bedtime <clears throat> sitting down front. But anyway, I, I know, right? It's not mine. Um, we, we do have some, uh, a lot of requests. Uh, Sister Maddie Driggers, um, she fell Monday evening, um, broke her hip. She fell in Bell's Outlet. They done surgery on her, a uh, partial hip replacement. They've not been able to wake her up. She's non-responsive right now. I uh, think she p potentially may have had a stroke, so they're doing a bunch of tests on her. Uh, so we, we desperately need to pray for Miss Maddie. Uh, Sean Cunningham, uh, Gina's brother, is in the hospital in Brunswick. They're doing some tests on him. He's having some issues. And so let's pray for him. Uh, Hank Corbett had a knee replacement done this morning. He's doing well, but uh, I, hopefully we'll get to come home tomorrow, but pray for him. Derek Edenfield had his gallbladder removed on, um, today's Wednesday, right? Monday. He had that removed and uh, had an attack on Sunday morning from it, so they had to go to the ER and they removed it. Uh, he's doing well from that, been in some pain, started running a little fever last night, but doing better. Uh, Miss Emily Groover, um, still in ICU in Savannah Memorial. Uh, they started her on dialysis today to help her, her kidneys. Her kidney function was almost at zero. 
so they're trying to do that and stop the bleeding inside so she's got a lot of things going on but they, they have seen some signs of improvement in her over the last couple of days so that that is a, a great thing sister shirley uh, we requested prayer for her sunday they did send her home just gave her some anti-seizure medicine but we still want to pray for her healing and sister mary peacock is uh she's been battling the shingles this week and so we we know some of you know that's a painful thing so I want us to pray for these and uh, just ask the Lord to, to touch them, heal them, perform the miraculous. There's some other unspoken requests that, that are among us that we, we know of that we want to ask the Lord to touch as well. Um, so if you would pray with me this evening. Heavenly Father, we just love you, Lord God. And Lord, your word tells us all throughout Scripture, Lord, it talks about our faith. According to our faith, be it done unto us, Lord, if we have faith of a grain of mustard seed, Lord, and... And God, you just encourage us, Lord God, to uh, have faith. And you even challenge us, Lord, in your word where we, where we pray, Lord, increase our faith. So God, we're asking you now in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we pray that, pray that prayer of faith that heals the sick according to Ephesians. We pray for each one of these needs, God. Every request that we called out tonight, Miss Maddie and Sean and Hank and Derek and Emily, Shirley and Mary, God, for each one of them, God, I just ask for your healing virtue Lord, as we, as our faith tonight, Lord God, comes before your throne, Lord God, and touches you, Lord God, that you would dispatch your, your virtue, Lord God, your healing power, Lord God, into their lives, each one of them, Lord God. We, we pray for the miraculous to happen, Lord. There's some that are in desperate and dire need of a miracle, Father. There's the, the doctors don't know what to do. There's nothing else they can do. Whatever the situation is, we serve a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So, Lord, we just pray for each one of these. Touch them, heal them, raise them up, Father, that, they, that first of all, that you would be glorified through this and that, God, that they would be a testimony and be able to give a testimony of your miracle-working power. Father, we love you. and We just ask that you would touch Brother Jason and anoint him tonight, God, as he brings your word to us. And, Father, we're going to give you the glory. And we're going to give you the honor for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, just continue to pray for these throughout the, the upcoming days and weeks. Brother Jason. Good evening, everybody. And appreciate you being with us as we continue on uh, this new series called Major Principles from the Minor Prophets. And we are looking at those 12 books at the end of the Old Testament, beginning with Hosea, going all the way through Malachi. We'll be looking at one book each week of this series and finding those truths that God has placed within each book that we can glean that still apply to our walk in Christianity today, even though they were messages from prophets to the kingdoms of Judah and Israel well over 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago minimum, uh, they still hold true for us today. And we want to delve into those, find those truths. So last week we began with Hosea. And if you missed that, uh, as always, I'll have the sheets from previous weeks on the back table. You can pick that up. And uh, this series is being live streamed and recorded, so you should be able to go back and find any lessons that you miss and get caught back up on that. Um, so this is our second week, and we'll be talking about the second of the Minor Prophets, which is Joel. Uh, as we said last week, the Minor Prophets are not in chronological order. Hosea ministered towards the end of the uh, kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, Joel was actually one of the first prophets to be sent to the southern kingdom of Judah. So the books are not ordered chronologically, but each one has a specific message that we want to talk about. Last week with Hosea, we talked about uh, forgiveness and faithfulness and the importance of being faithful. Tonight, we're going to talk about Joel's message that we're all in this together. Uh, so as we said just a second ago, historically, Joel was one of the first prophets to be sent to Judah. Remember that after Solomon, the kingdom uh, of the Israelites split into two, and you had the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, that was made up of ten tribes, and you had the southern kingdom called Judah, that was made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And Judah was the location of the temple. It was the location where the worship of God continued. 
although throughout their history, even though they had the temple of Jehovah there in their midst, they also began to flirt with other gods and with idolatry and moved away. So God sent prophets to them to turn them back to the right path. Uh, and if you read, and as you read the Minor Prophets, you should also read the books of Kings and Chronicles so you can get the history of what was happening and mix it with the prophecies that God sent to them, the warnings that God would speak through the prophets to bring them back in line. And that will help you understand how if you read the books of Kings and Chronicles, you see kind of the seesaw effect between good kings and wicked kings, and good kings and wicked kings as they would turn to God or turn away from God. So what we see in Joel is a warning that God sends to the people of Judah because they are starting to turn away from him. And he sends this warning in the form of a plague of locusts. And the first chapter especially of Joel describes this plague of locusts. And it is it, most likely an actual plague of locusts that came through at that time, but is symbolic of greater judgment by God. And we realize that God can bring judgment through natural events, like natural disasters, a plague of locusts, things along those lines, uh, that it doesn't have to be just symbolic. The plague of locusts themselves were a judgment from God because of the sin of Judah that they had turned away from him. Uh, but thankfully, Joel doesn't leave us with that judgment and with the destruction of the plague of locusts. He also, towards the end of his prophecy, looks beyond his day, uh, looks beyond what was happening just at his time, and describes the future, the future not only of Israel as a nation that would be restored, uh, but also the eventual reign of the Messiah, the promised Savior of Israel, uh, who is Jesus, who is our Savior as well. So there are aspects of Joel's prophecy that we can apply to ourselves as Christians and to the church as a whole as we look at what God is saying to the nation of Judah. And then there's something for us to realize as we go through this whole series that the nations of Israel and Judah in many cases can stand in for the church today. The, the nations of Israel and Judah were the collective body of the people of God. And today, that is the church. The church is the collective body of Christ. So when we see warnings made to Israel or Judah, we see the way God dealt with Israel and Judah in the past and in the prophets, then we can see that he will deal similarly with the church today. So as we go through the book of Joel tonight, we will definitely see that. Uh, and so let's read a little bit in Joel. Uh, and we'll start with this chapter 1 with the plague of locusts that he describes. We'll start at the very beginning. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell you your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten, and that which the locust has left has the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath eaten has the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because the new wine is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. And he goes on to describe the destruction. That army he talks about in that last verse is this army of locusts. Um, historically and even today, uh, locusts will develop in the plains of Africa as just normal grasshoppers. But once they reach a certain population, they undergo a transformation and they become locusts. They become uh, this different style of grasshopper that then moves like a cloud across the land, devouring everything in its place. Uh, if we get into verse 4, in the King James, it calls it the palmer worm and the locust and the canker worm and the caterpillar. Um, newer translations of that talk about different types of locusts, hopping locusts or flying locusts. Or they, and the locust itself as an animal goes through several phases of development. 
uh, as it matures. And that's what he's referring to with these descriptions in verse 4, is that each phase becomes progressively worse. And whatever the locusts have not eaten in the first phase, the next phase, they attack that. And then the next phase, whatever's left after that. And eventually, after all the phases of this animal have gone through, then there's nothing left, that they have completely destroyed the land. The beginning, however, is what I want to look at, where Joel says to the elders, he says, listen, elders, tell this to your children, and let them tell it to their children, and, and so forth. Has this ever been, has there ever been anything like this that you can remember? And he goes through and describes the destruction that is coming. Uh, so one thing we will see throughout all of Joel's prophecy is that he includes all elements of society in this message. This message is not just for one group of people. It's not just for one age. It's not just for one segment of society. It's for the whole nation. And we saw in the first few verses how Joel asked the old men to tell their children and then pass that word down from generation to generation. This is clear that the message about this is for all ages. It's not just for one age group, it's to be shared from the elders to the middle age to the young and then beyond into future generations that have not even come about yet. If we read on in the rest of, of chapter 1, as Joel continues to describe the judgment of God that's coming, he talks about several different groups of people. We saw in verse 5 he talks about drunkards. In verse 8 he says, lament like a virgin. He talks about maidens. Uh, in verses 9 and 13, he talks about the priests mourning and, and the ministers of the Lord mourning. We get into verse 11, he talks about the husbandmen or the farmers. So we see all these different areas of the society that he says, this message is for you. It's not just for the elders, it's not just for the priests, it's for everything from the virgin maidens to the drunkards and everybody in between. This message is for the whole nation. No group, no age group would be left out. Everyone would suffer because of this judgment that God was going to pour out upon the nation. As we said earlier, the nation of Judah stands as a symbol of the church today. And we need to understand that the message of God for the church is for the whole church. It's for all age groups. It's for all people within the church. Uh, we have to realize that the church needs to be unified. We need to stand as a whole that encompasses all ages. It encompasses all types of people. Uh, I know some of you have been in my Foundations of Faith class, and we talk about in the Apostles' Creed, one of the ways the church is described is Catholic with lower C, lowercase c, which means universal, that it is to be available for all people. The church is intended for everyone. And Joel is, is really showing this in a symbolic fashion through the people of Judah here, that we should all work together within the church. And if judgment comes from God, then we're all going to be a part of that. We're all going to suffer that judgment if we're working as a whole body and if we allow uh, the situation for the need of judgment to arise, then judgment's going to come upon all of us. These locusts weren't going to hit somebody's field and skip somebody else's. These locusts were going to come through and lay waste to the whole land, so it was going to affect everyone. And I think sometimes in the church today, we get this idea that we each stand individually separate from each other. But the church is the church. We are a body of believers. And if, uh, in the New Testament it says, if one member hurts, all members hurt. And that is the way God intended it to be, that what affects you affects me because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are one together. We are all baptized into one spirit. We are all made one body of Christ together. So we can't separate ourselves within the church from each other. We have to feel our neighbor's pain. We have to bear our brother's burden because that's the call of, that's why God gave us the church, so that we can support each other and we're standing as one. When we look today at the church as a whole, capital C, big church, every, uh, all the believers in Christ, how often do we restrict the work of the church to one age group? 
you think about it, we, we say, okay, these people are really too young to do anything, and maybe these people, are, they've done too much, they're too old, they, they, and, and we try to put it all on, on a certain age group that these are the ones that are going to do the work. But look at what Joel said. He said he talked to the elders first, but he didn't leave it with them. He said, tell your children and let them tell their children and their children. And we'll see later on in other places in here where he talks about all generations. Uh, Jesus was the same way. He ministered to all age groups. We see Jesus in the Gospels talking with elders of Israel, people like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea, who were elder statesmen of the nation. But we also see him telling the disciples, suffer the little children to come unto me. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them. We see him go and, and heal Jairus' daughter. We see him minister to people of all age groups. He, he ministered to little children. He ministered to the elderly. He ministered to everybody in between. And if we even look at Jesus' disciples, they included a wide range of people. We, don't know, we often think of the disciples as, oh, they're the disciples. But they were also individuals. They were people just like us. And when you really study who they were, you had a wide range of age groups. You had everybody from John, who was a teenager, up to people like Simon the Zealot and Matthew who were probably at least in their 50s, if not older. So you had a 40-year-plus range of age groups within the, the disciples themselves. And Jesus picked those people. He picked a variety of ages because he wanted to minister to everyone. So if Jesus picked a variety of ages to form the core group of the disciples and they were to do the work that he started on this earth, should not the church today likewise involve all ages as we minister? Uh, we need to lay aside these concerns about individual differences or preferences, and we need to pull together for the kingdom of God because someone that I may be able to reach as, as a middle-aged person may be different than someone a teenager can reach, which may be different than someone that an, an elder statesman of the church can reach. We all have different styles. We all have different ways of doing the work of God, but we're all uh, trying to achieve the same goal, the expansion of the kingdom of God. And if we're all pulling together, how much more work can we do? Have you ever seen a, a rowing crew? And those little tiny boats, <laughs> how do they row? They all pull together, and they're organized, and they're all pulling in the same direction at the same time. Each person has their own oar, but they're all pulling together to achieve the same goal, and those boats fly across the water. Well, that's what God has called us to be like. We each have our own oar. We're each going to do our own rowing, but we need to all row together with the same purpose and in the same direction. And if we do that, then we're being the church like God called us to be. But not just age groups. There are times we withhold the availability of the church from certain people. I think we're getting better about this, but the church has been through periods of time where we try to say, no, you, you can't be a part of this. And we should never tell people they cannot come and receive from Christ. You know, we, um, if you notice Joel's prophecy, he talks to the elders, but who was the very second group he said? Awake ye drunkards. And then later on he talks about the, the pure, the maidens, the virgins. They were all part of this prophecy. From the unrighteous to the righteous and everybody in between, they were all subject to the message of God. Joel was saying, this message is for you, whether you're unrighteous or righteous, this message is important. And today the church needs to be open for all to come and receive from Jesus. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous to repentance. And so we are often demanding purity from people before they come to the faith. If we couldn't get right without Jesus, how do we expect them to? You know, we, we need to allow people to come and hear the Word of God, to experience the move of the Spirit, to, to feel that tug of conviction, and then lead them into the presence of God. How else will they know who Jesus is unless they have opportunity 
But very often we try to demand a, even just a certain level of behavior before we'll allow someone to hear the message of Christ. Now, I'm not advocating that we treat unrighteousness as something that's okay for the church. Once we know Christ, then we should live a righteous life. We should change behavior. We should become like the maiden, not like the drunkard. We should become the pure and not the unrighteous, but we do that through the influence of the Holy Spirit within our life. We do that through the process called sanctification, but we can't expect that process to start until we know Christ and have received the earnest of the Spirit within our hearts and allow Him to work within us. Uh, so, Joel's emphasis on all of Judah translating to the church and the church being universal means we have to allow all ages, all people to be welcome to come in and hear the word and receive from God and be a part of our services. We have to understand sanctification has to follow justification. We can't demand people get their life straight before we give them the water of life. Uh, when we look at what Jesus said uh, at the very end of the book. Revelation chapter 22, last chapter, near the last verse. This is, is some of the last things Jesus is telling this church. It says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. This is Jesus' call to us about how we should Welcome people into receiving what we have already received. Welcome people in. Whoever is thirsty, whoever desires to, let them come and receive the water of life. Notice who's saying it. The Spirit says it. The bride. Who is the bride? Us, believers, the church. We are supposed to be saying to everyone, come along with the Spirit. The Spirit and the bride say, if we're in step with the Spirit of God then his desires and our desires should be the same, and that desire should be to have people come and receive the water of life, receive Christ, receive the salvation that we have already partaken of, but they need. And if we are allowing all people to come in and receive, we're not going to prevent a sinner from coming and hearing the word of God just because they may look a little different, they may act a little different, or the way I've always liked it put, they sin differently from you. Okay. We have these certain ideas of certain sins that, oh, this is worse and, and we can't allow these people in. Well, we can't allow the church to participate in those sins, but a sinner's going to sin. That's what they do until they meet Christ. And they're not going to meet Christ unless we allow them to come in and hear the word. So I'm urging us all to welcome the unchurched. Welcome those who don't know, those who are thirsty for the water of life. And let's not withhold it from them. Because Joel says, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming on everyone, and we need to allow everyone to come in. Um, and on this same note, when we look back at Joel, and we look at who this judgment is coming on, notice that those who work directly for God are also suffering God's judgment alongside those whose work was indirect. Mixed together at the end of chapter 1, Joel talks about the priests and the farmers and how judgment was going to affect all of them. These locusts were going to come in. They were going to lay waste to every field. Obviously, the farmers are going to be affected because it's their fields. But the priests, they didn't grow their own food. They were the only people in Israel who didn't. They received the tithes. They received the offerings made by the people of God. If the farmers lost their crops, they weren't going to have any offerings to give at the temple. The priests were going to lose their livelihood too. And so Joel talks to both groups together about how uh, in verse 9 he tells the priests, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord ministers, mourn. And then if we go down to verse 11, he talks about the husbandmen, the farmers, or the vine dressers. He says, the wheat and the barley, the harvest is perished. And then when we get to verse 13, he's back to the priests again. 
He says, lament, you priests, how you ministers of the altar for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of the Lord. So we see that we can't think that the church is going to be separate from a national judgment. I think too often today we feel like uh, in the church, it's only those whose official titled job as minister are the ones that are subject to God's expectations. We think, oh, the pastor will take care of it. The youth pastor or the music minister will do it. Um, but that's not the case. We're all called to be ministers. We're all called to do the work of God. Joel talked to the, the priest, but he also talked to the farmers, and he said, this is happening to everybody. This is going to affect all of you. Um, in the New Testament, the apostles were not the only ones who did the work of the church. Read the book of Acts. We see the apostles. We see John and Peter go and minister. We see James. We, we see Paul. But we also see Stephen. We see Philip. We see Apollos. We see Priscilla and Aquila. We, we, we see other people who were lay people of the church, but who ministered and did work. We even see people like Tabitha, who ministered through handicrafts and making blankets and, and clothes and things for people. And when she died, they were distraught because of the ministry she did and how she showed the love of God to the people around her. And so we see that it wasn't just the apostles. It wasn't just the titled people who ministered on God's behalf. It was all of the church. We see stories of regular church members who were used in the gifts of the Spirit. We see the prophet Agabus, who was not an apostle, but he was used in the gift of prophecy in the early church to prophesy about a famine that was coming and, and how the church needed to prepare for that. We see uh, people who gave the opportunity for the church to meet in their house. They had the gift of hospitality that they shared the love of God by opening their homes for a meeting place. We see so many different ways that the church is called to minister. But it takes all of that. It's not just those who carry the title of pastor. It's all of us who are called to minister, who are called to do the work. Because imagine what Acts would have been like if it were just the twelve who did anything. What would have happened if we hadn't had Stephen? What would happen if we hadn't had Philip? Philip opened the door for so many different groups. The entire nation of Ethiopia was saved because of the work of Philip, who was not an apostle. There was an apostle named Philip, but the Philip I'm talking about was not. He spoke to one man who went back and saved in a nation. And Ethiopia, even today, remains one of the longest-lasting Christian nations in the world. So... The work that a, a non-titled person can do is very powerful and, and in some cases more influential than some of the apostles were. So we cannot rely solely upon professional ministers, but we need to have the entire church be the church and do the work that God intended. Jesus told all of his followers, go ye into all the world and make disciples. He didn't just tell the 12. He told all of it. He appeared to 500 people at one point sharing the message of, of what he intended for us to do. So we need to let the entire church minister. And we see that in Joel as he talks about the priests, but he also talks about the farmers, that all were involved. Um, there was, then we talk about in Joel, when we get to chapter 2, we get into the meat of it. In Joel chapter 1, he talks about the coming judgment. He says, this plague of locusts is headed your way. Destruction is coming because of sin. But chapter 2 tells how the nation can avoid that through repentance. How the direction that God was, was heading the nation in could be turned, could be averted by repenting of their sin. And there's two parts to this. He talks about how the repentance should be made and who should make it. And so first and foremost, we have to understand that repentance has to be sincere, has to be true, has to be real. Let's read that in Joel chapter 2, uh, verse 12 and 13. It says, Therefore also now says the Lord, Turn even to me with all your heart, 
and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repents himself of the evil. Very powerful verses. I think these two verses are probably the key to all of the book of Joel, where he says, turn to the Lord with all your heart. When we repent, when we are turning back to God, it has to be with all our heart. It has to be sincere. It has to be meant, intended, intentional, not just lip service, not just something that's done as a show. And that's what he's talking about in verse 13, where he says, rend your hearts and not your garments. In Joel's day, a sign of distress, a sign of sorrow was to tear the clothes. And people would do that as a show. Oh, I'm so distraught. I'm so distraught. You ever seen one of those people that's really dramatic? You know, that, that's, that's the people we're dealing with here. They're going to rip their clothes and talk about how sorry they are, but they don't change anything. And that had been going on. Joel was not the first prophet that was sent to Judah. Others had ministered as well. But people were rending their clothes, but not their hearts. They were tearing their garments and making the show of repentance, but they didn't change their behavior. They didn't change what they were doing that was bringing God's judgment in the first place. And God says to them, you need to return with all your heart. You need to be sincere. You need to tear your hearts. I don't care if you tear your clothes, tear your hearts. Change what's going on inside. Don't let it be an outward show of repentance. It's got to be an inward sorrow. If you don't have that inward sorrow, it's meaningless. Uh, in the New Testament, we're told that godly sorrow is effective. In Matthew chapter 6, we have the Sermon on the Mount, the words of Jesus. Uh, and he talks about that hypocrisy was still around even in Jesus' day, hundreds of years after Joel. He says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to fast, but unto your Father which is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. He's talking about that hypocrisy that I think we still find in the church today of people who can put on a good show of doing church and can look it on the outside, but their heart isn't turned towards God. They're rending their clothes. They're, they're disfiguring their countenance. They're making the show, but is it sincere? Is it really going on on the inside with what God wants? When we look at verse 12, uh, in Joel, they're talking about repentance. We go back to chapter 2, verse 12, and he says, turn to me with your heart. How do we do that? He says, with fasting and weeping and mourning. There are things we need to do, and, and fasting and weeping and mourning, that sorrow. If it's true repentance, that sorrow is going to come out in a way that shows its meaning, that your heart is broken. When's the last time we got heartbroken because of something we did that was against God's will? Even, even as saved people, we still mess up from time to time. But are our hearts broken by it? Is our repentance sincere? Do we rend our hearts? Or do we just show up at church the next time and put on that church mask and go about doing business the way we always know how to do it because we've done it so long? We should be rending our hearts. We should be turning back to God with our whole heart. And that would involve fasting and weeping and mourning and being truly sorrowful for what we have, have done that leads us away from God. That's true repentance. Do we repent with all our heart today or do we act on what others have called cheap grace? That we rest so heavily on the grace of God that we treat it as a, a granted gift and something that is just going to happen. Oh, God will forgive me. And we don't think about what Jesus did to buy that forgiveness. It's not cheap grace. It costs Jesus everything. It costs the Father his Son. It's not cheap. But we treat it that way so often. And yes, God does forgive. And yes, God is merciful. 
But if we truly love him, will we not be sorrowful for causing him pain? Will we not be distraught that we have taken our Lord and nailed him back to the cross and put him back through that shame again? We need to be sorrowful. We need to have sincere repentance with true inward sorrow over our actions as we turn back. If we continue on in Joel chapter 2, just as Joel showed us that all parts of society were going to be subject to God's judgment, in chapter 2 he shows us that all elements of society are required to participate in repentance. Uh, Let's read verses 15 through 17, where Joel says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that are infants, and let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her dressing room. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? Notice all the different groups of people that Joel said need to be involved in this solemn assembly, in this coming together for the purpose of repentance. He talks about the elders. He talks about the children. He talks about the infants. He talks about the bride and the bridegroom, the priests, everybody. He says everybody is supposed to be a part of this coming together for repentance. And what we're talking about here in Joel chapter 2 is national repentance. The nation had gone away from God. This was an attempt to turn the nation back to God, to bring them back into right standing with him and repent of the idolatry and the wickedness that they had participated in. And Joel says everybody needs to be involved in this, from the oldest to the youngest. It doesn't matter if you just got married, you're here. It doesn't matter if you're a priest, you're here. Everybody needs to be involved with this. Uh, our nation today stands in need of repentance. Our, Our nation stands in need of returning to God. But how often does the church stand aside and point an accusing finger without participating in that repentance? We're too often ready to point out the faults of our nation and the faults of our leaders and the faults of others without recognizing the fault of the church, that there's enough blame to go around. In Joel's day, all were called to participate in this national repentance, and the church today must participate in a national repentance. We can't just point our finger and say, you're wrong. We need to point out sin, things that are wrong. But if we're pointing a finger, how easy is it to pull someone up? You need a hand to lift someone out of the mess they're in. And if all you're doing is pointing a finger, they have nothing to grab onto. We need to reach down a hand and say, yes, what you're doing is wrong. Let me show you what's right. Let me introduce you to someone who can make it right. Let me bring you into this body of the church. And more than that, we can't claim immunity as the church, immunity from a need to repent. If the nation has left God... How did they get there if the church was doing its job? If the church was doing what the church was supposed to do, how did the nation leave God? We are called to be the city on a hill. We're called to be the light in the darkness. If they've gone astray, it's because we weren't showing the way. It's because the church fell down on its job that was left to it by Christ. And so we have guilt within ourselves that we have not led the nation, when we look at the verses I just read in Joel, he calls everyone to the assembly, but who was supposed to lead the repentance? Verse 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say to God, spare your people. The priests were to lead that repentance. Is the church leading a national repentance today? Or are we casting blame and saying, I wish it were different. I wish it could be some other way. Or are we falling before God and repenting 
not just that the nation has gone away, but repenting that we've dropped the ball, repenting that we're not, we did not do what we're supposed to do. And then if it's true repentance, like we talked about earlier, we're going to change our actions. We're going to be the church that we've called, been called to be. We're going to reach that hand down to lift someone up. We're going to minister to the people that God puts in our path and puts around us. We're going to be the church that God called the church to be. The light and the darkness. The city set on the hill. The one that people can look to and go, that's the way. I'm stuck in the darkness here. Let me go see what they're talking about because they've got something going on that I need. Well, when you look back at the past 20, 30, 40 years, has the church been that? Has the church been an example of something that the rest of the world says, I want that? Individual churches, yes, here and there, but the church as a whole, I feel, has dropped the ball. Let's pick it back up. Let's get back on task. It's not too late. Let's go out into the harvest. And uh, so the church needs to participate. We must repent alongside the rest of the nation, repenting that we have fallen short of what God entrusted to us uh, because the church would be guilty of that. We know that that is our goal, not just in the Old Testament, what we've seen in Joel, but also in the New Testament. We find in 1 Peter chapter 4 uh, and verse 7, uh, sorry, verse 17, it says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of those that do not obey the gospel of God? Peter tells us we're involved in this whole thing. Judgment begins with us. And I believe we're going to have to answer to God for what we have failed to do. The Bible says to him who knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. How much have we failed to do that we know is right? That should lead us to this repentance we were talked about, that, that godly sorrow, that desire to come back into right relationship with God, to, to be where he has called us to be, doing the work he's called us to do. And Joel is, is saying that just as, as he says to the whole nation, look, this judgment's coming. These locusts are ready. God's ready to pour this out. But call a fast, call an assembly, repent, turn back with your whole heart, rend your hearts, not your garments, get it right. And God is merciful, and it says God will repent himself of the evil. What that means, that word repent in that passage in the, in the King James, means God will change his mind. God will not bring this judgment upon you that he has said he will bring because you have rent your hearts. You have turned back to him. So after the verse we just stopped at, we stopped at verse 17, where he says, let the priest lead this repentance. Let them call to God. Spare your people. When we get to verse 18, from there to the end, we start seeing the result of that repentance. We see what God promises to do if we turn back to him. The very, and we can just read verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. If we repent, it says God will turn back to us. If we turn back to God, he'll turn back to us. Instead of judgment, he will have pity. Instead of bringing locusts, look what in verse 19 he promises to bring. Yes, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you will be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Instead of destruction, God says, I'm going to bring you blessing. We want the blessing, but how did they get it in Joel's day? They got it through repentance. They got it through turning to God with their whole heart. If we find ourselves in a situation where us individually or us as a church or us as a nation is staring in the face of judgment and destruction, if we don't want that to come upon us, if we want the blessings of God that he's promised throughout his word, then we have to repent. We have to turn I'm not saying we are sinners bound for hell. I'm saying we got stuff we got to get out of our life. We got stuff we've got to deal with and turn more fully to God. 
And if we do that, we open ourselves up to the blessings of God that are promised here. And so much of the rest of, Ch of Joel deals with how God responds to national repentance, to individual repentance, and he brings those blessings. The most famous passage in Joel is uh, towards the end of chapter 2, and it's the one that Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and that is verse 28 and 29 where he says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. We like to talk about that one, especially in the Pentecostal church, because Peter talks about it on the day of Pentecost. He quotes that verse. We talk about pouring out his spirit upon us. But I want to look at at the rest of this tonight. What have we been talking about with all of, of this tonight? That judgment was going to come upon everybody and that repentance was required of everybody. But look who God says the blessings will come upon. Everybody. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. Even the servants or the slaves are involved in this. It's free people and servants. It, it's your employers. It's your workers. It's everybody. And this is the greatest blessing because it's not corn or wine or oil that was promised earlier. He says, I will pour out my spirit. I will place my presence upon all of these groups. It's great to have those physical or natural blessings. It's, it's nice to have uh, the corn and the wine and the oil, the, the, the money, the, the benefits of this world. But it's much greater to have the benefits that can only come from God and that last in this world and beyond. To have the Spirit poured out upon us and within us. Remember, Joel is prophesying in the Old Testament. There was a limited number of people who experienced the presence of God. It would be the prophets for a time. The Spirit would come upon them as they ministered, and then the Spirit would leave. The high priest on one day of the year would experience the Spirit of God on the Day of Atonement. Occasionally, some other people would have a, an experience of an angel or, or the presence of God, but it was rare. Joel's promising, I will pour out my Spirit upon everybody... And everybody will participate. That's the blessing we have today. That's why Peter quoted this on the, the day of Pentecost. He's saying now the presence of God active in our lives is available to everyone. Young, old, sons, daughters, anybody. It's available. Anybody can be part of God's kingdom. Anybody can participate in what God has promised but again, how did they get there? Through repentance. They got there through turning from their wicked ways and turning to God. So everyone is included. And that's the situation we live in under today. God has poured out his spirit from the day of Pentecost to now. And, and he allows his presence to dwell within each of us. And we have to realize it's available to everyone. When we look in the New Testament, we see several places. And I'm just going to talk about two of them where he talks about how everyone should be a part of this. In Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 6 through 11, it says, God will render to every man according to his deeds, to those who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But unto those that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish, anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. He's saying God is going to, God is willing to pour out the benefits of his kingdom upon anyone, Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter, there's no respect of persons. But there's a flip side to that coin also, that if we persist in remaining apart from God, then the judgment of God is waiting on that side as well. But he's saying there's no respect to persons. Who you are, who your mama was, who your daddy was, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what age you are. God is not a respecter of persons. His benefits are available to all. 
His judgment will fall on all, depending on how they turn to him. He says he will render every man according to his deeds, talking about our acceptance of Christ or not. If we look in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, uh, he says there that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God stands ready for anyone to come to him. Anyone can make the turn that Joel prophesied about in chapter 2 to rend our hearts and not our garments. To, to turn in true, sincere repentance. We all have that opportunity, and that allows us to fulfill what we said earlier in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, that let all who thirst come and drink of the water of life freely, that it's available to everyone. So what we see in Joel is not just a, a prophecy to a nation that lived thousands of years ago. It's, it's not just a, a poem, really, chapter 1 is very poetic. It's not just a poem about a locust invasion. It's a message to us today about how all of us are involved in this walk. That judgment will fall on all when we turn away from God. Repentance is required of all. But the benefits of restoration, the benefits that come from being in the will of God are also available to all. So what I hope we learn from Joel is that we're all in this together Amen. and that we need to be supporting each other as the church, that when one of us hurts, I hurt with you. I'm gonna, as we, we started off tonight being that, we had needs that were brought to this church of people in distress and, and physical need that we bound together as a church and, and brought those petitions before God. Now, it's not just that we pray, but we do all of the things that the church does in supporting people, whether it's somebody in a physical need, somebody in a financial need, somebody in an emotional need who just needs a, a shoulder to cry on or a, a hand to lift them up. We need to be the church. We need to all be on that together because, uh, as we said earlier, I think the church has dropped the ball in many cases with what God left us to do. So I call on all of us to pick the ball back up. Yes. And let's run again, as God called us to do, so that we can be the church. Um, and so next week, we move on to Amos. Uh, Amos is a little longer. Joel was only three chapters, so you didn't have that much to read last week. Amos is a little longer. Um, but please read Amos before we come back next week, and we will continue on with seeing what God has to show us out of that book. So I appreciate you being here. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to come together to share your word. And I pray that it will be planted as a seed within our hearts, and it will grow and bring forth fruit to your kingdom, that you will help us turn wholeheartedly towards you, that in areas where we have fallen short, that you will bring about sincere repentance in our heart, that we may draw closer to you, and that we may lead others to repentance, and that we may all receive the benefits of a relationship with you, the spirit that is given within us to guide us daily and to strengthen us. I pray that you go with each person as we leave this place, uplift and strengthen our faith throughout this week. Let us be ready for opportunities that you place 